Hey everyone, I hope everyone is very well. It's almost 6.30 a.m. Central Standard Time, January 17, 2020. I'm making this video today because, um, on the normal, most people are not getting to see most of the work that I'm doing. The reason that that is, is because the, the greatest majority of the work I'm doing, um, the largest amount of my time, is put into researching, gathering information, and putting it all together for the book, working title being The Bible Versus the Ancient Near East. Now, the reason that I'm not making videos in between, uh, giving you snippets of various materials, runoff materials or extras, uh, it's just a few reasons. One reason is um, actually the the amount of time I usually have to put into uh, to documents or some even limited research on the the two podcasts that I'm producing right now, the Bible and Obrey and the Everything Keys, they take up a pretty good amount of time just on their own. Um, and the Everything Keys, we will be back next week. It's been the holidays. It, it's it's uh, it's kind of messed everything up. It usually does around this time of year, you know. So we've got to get resettled and and on a steady course again. Um, the other thing is that um, I don't I don't want to I don't want to release too much information uh, on uh, the the book concerning geography issues because you know if I put too much out one thing that I'm concerned about is that there there won't be enough uh, anticipation for the book now it's this isn't really about marketing or sales like I ever thought that I would write a book that essentially challenges uh, the assumptions of uh, some of the major religions of the world okay everything everything that falls under the banner of Christianity everything that falls under the banner of Judaism or falls under the banner of Islam it's challenging dogmas uh, which are are deep held dogmas they're of course not deeply researched dogmas but definitely deeply held dogmas concerning the uh, assumption that these events happened around the Levant around the Middle East the ancient Near East that's all we ever hear about but I never thought for a moment that I was going to really profit off of um, a, a literary assault on, on not only a belief that <laughs> those those huge huge major and uh, powerful and influential world religions have but also the fact that this challenge is the um, well let's just say that uh, were to caught uh, to catch on and uh, at, at some point it will but I mean if it were to right away what it's going to do is it's going to also challenge the economies of countries that are considered to have um, Bible sites within them because tourism is such a huge industry for a number of countries not only in the Middle East but just considered to be around the Mediterranean let's not forget you know Greece Rome and Turkey are also sites where people would go on Bible tours some of these these tours you know they can sell themselves as uh, Bible tours or Mediterranean tours, and and this this would extend all the way over to the Tigris and Euphrates basin. Okay, so that's a that's a really large part of the world, and you know I'm not sure what presents the strongest resistance to that uh, deeply held religious dogmas or 
uh, financial gains. I'm not sure which one is necessarily stronger. So it's, it's definitely not a financial thing. And at my house, we work. And I have a few faithful supporters who send financial support. And I, you can't know how much that means to me. It means, it means a lot in the sense of um, just that vote of confidence. But it also means a lot that you're, you're willing to, to support with money that you earn because in this day and age yeah it's harder and harder for certain people to earn enough money to get by because of this this slavery userous system we're under so i i really do appreciate that and uh i actually had one supporter that has sent seed money for me to self publish the book because i just didn't think that there would be any publisher really interested and I don't want to enter into negotiations with anybody concerning the material uh, I have no intention of in any way adjusting the material or anything like that if if somebody wanted to offer to produce or distribute once it's together um, then that might be another story if anybody is interested, as I go, in sending money to be put d towards, directly towards the, the self-publishing of the book, there's a number of ways that you can contact or, or donate to me. I, I have them on the Obrey Project webpage on the contact uh, portion. You know, you can friend me on Facebook. Um, there's, I still have that app. Um, I don't think anybody's actually used it. It's usually, they, they usually either send through Facebook Messenger or directly to me. You can just send by mail, uh, checks or whatever. Um, I've had some that have actually gotten me items that I, I need to actually work. Um, so there's, there's various ways. And, and if you want to send a donation specifically that goes towards self publishing, just let me know and it goes aside in its own envelope basically to be put towards that okay so that is essentially why I don't make uh, more frequent videos it's just those other things that uh, oftentimes uh, require a lot of attention the Bible and Obrey is only going to have a couple more episodes of this season and you know the the topic I picked to sort of uh, highlight in word studies that different it'll probably be at least a few months in between them so I can get things together and uh, I definitely want to try to finish the book uh, at least get it to the the stage where it can be edited before I start uh, another season of something like that which really requires a commitment so in this video I'm going to be reading from a document that was produced in 1982. It was, it's called Water as a Source of Cooperation or Conflict in the Middle East. And I would say definitely more conflict than cooperation. Um, and it was produced by the Defense Intelligence Agency. And now, uh, keep in mind when I read these, these things, um, I believe that, let's see, that the, the man who wrote it was a Robert DeGross, Ph.D. And the population of, let's just say the population of Israel-Palestine, okay? So all of the territory that we would consider Israel-slash-Palestine. And you could probably even include the, the Golan Heights in there. Um, was right around 4 million in 1982 when he's writing this. Uh, at least that's what the official numbers were. Uh, right before uh, the Jews started taking over the land in the 1940s, the population was just over a million. And, and that's that's after they had 
that's after they had, had been importing Jews uh, for a while. Anybody who knows about Operation Magic Carpet knows that just to boost the numbers of people claiming to be Jews, they shipped up like tens of thousands at least of Ye Yemeni uh, self-professed Jews. So they got they got the number up to around 1415 in the mid to late 1940s. Before that, the population was under a million uh, of people that, uh, and that this were, was the basic inhabitant during the time of the Ottoman Empire. It was under a million, and it was just common subsistence life. Um, these people did not have lower numbers or uh, practice the professions they did because they were uh, a lesser people than the Jew, uh, which I know that uh, the Jews over there uh, thoroughly believe them to be. It is because that first off, w the types of professions and the way of life that was lived there before the 1940s was the way of life that that land demanded. That's important to understand. The land dictated the way of life, the amount of farming that could be, be done because of the amount of water that was available. Same thing with herding. Same thing with any kind of industry. Before the Jews started moving in in the early uh, 19, the 1940s, a little bit before, but very much after that time, of course, with uh, all of the, the nonsense uh, that went down concerning their propaganda around World War II and, and afterwards, they've really, really packed them in there. Now, today, uh, the official numbers say that the population between Jews and Arabs, and, you know, I don't really know that those people even like to be called Arabs. I'm sure they would prefer being called something else, whether it be Palestinians or whatever else. That blanket term, Arab, um, you know. Anyways, so he wrote this report in 82, and it has to do with the water. Uh, just like the title says. And it's got a lot of really interesting information on all of the rivers, uh, the important waterways, anyways, of the Middle East. He mostly concentrates on the, the Nile, the uh, Shat al-Arab, which is uh, the confluence of the Tigris and Euphrates uh, down between Iran and Iraq. Um, the... Well, it, it was traditionally called the Leontes. Uh, now it's the Latani. And, and that flows kind of to the south and then straight west in Lebanon. And then the Orontes, which actually flows near the same source as the uh, Latani, but it flows northward and then out to the sea in Lebanon. And also, uh, I believe, the Euphrates and the Jordan. So those are the rivers that he mostly concentrates on. He does get into uh, the other smaller rivers, too, because they all tend to contribute to these important river systems. He's not concentrating on them, I think, for any other reason than their importance concerning uh, political activities and whatnot. So I'm going to start with, this is his introduction. I'm only going to read a bit of this. The, the really important stuff here so I can help you understand the just the insanity of believing in ignorance that these events could have happened over here now for anybody who wants to to rapidly make arguments concerning desertification uh, well, first off, there is no way for you to prove that. And I'll tell you what, there is a heck of a lot of sand over there. 
you're going to have to prove where that sand came from too. Even though you, you cannot prove desertification, it is a theory. That is a lot of sand that's over there. A lot of sand and a lot of gravel. You see the ground, the rocks, the geology. You'd have to prove somehow that that all changed too because all of it works together to create or maintain the systems that we see over there today. Besides for that fact, there is the fact that I clearly illustrated in the first paper I wrote on this subject, which is available at the website on the resources page, the patriarchs, their livestock, and the land, which I graciously made into a video as well. You can see that there is a certain amount of space needed even in countries that might be extremely lush, that might offer uh, great rich soil growing potentials for either agriculture or grazing, you still need a certain amount of land per people to sustain them. So there's a lot of problems that nobody seems to be dealing with. However, at the same time, it seems that most people uh, are perfectly happy with accepting the shoddy records of only a few highly questionable writers and historians, basically characters who just proving their existence is difficult. All right. Uh, apparently, they're very happy with just uh, believing uh, all of that nonsense, uh, even though they can see that the the world is 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 nothing but lies and deception. But we can count on ancient history. So, in this introduction, the author says that. Um, the combination of evaporation and non-consumptive uses reduces the water quality of each of these rivers to the extent that several carry concentrations of dissolved solids in their downstream reaches that include cultivation or salinity sensitive crops. That's important. This condition also imposes severe constraints on the design of current and future irrigation systems. In addition to having nurtured the development of some of the most comprehensive water management schemes of antiquity, this region has witnessed the implementation of some of the most ambitious water management initiatives of modern times. Many of these systems were planned during a colonial era when Western European governments could aspire to comprehensive control of entire basins. The realities of mid-20th century politics, however, have dashed those hopes. Current water management developments in the region represent, at best, piecemeal realization of components of larger schemes and fall short of the benefits that might be realized by all water users from basin-wide management available water resources. Now, concerning the water management systems of antiquity, what I'm seeing just in the in my opinion, the propaganda pieces that were put out mostly in the 1800s. This was when um, the Palestinian Exploration Fund uh, was doing surveys and mapping the, uh, the western areas. There were uh, various... Uh, the PEF was also involved to, to a degree, and there were... Uh, various peoples that were being funded to go explore, uh, map uh, the the Transjordan. So, when you say Transjordan, we're thinking in biblical terms, right? When we say Transjordan, we're thinking of what's supposed to be the lands of Moab and Ammon, and basically up to Hermon. 
and then the the Negev would probably you'd probably have to mix together. Uh, Edom would probably have to be a mix of of both the Negev and uh, and the Transjordan, which just Edom in and of itself. If if you if you're gonna buy that, it's south of the Dead Sea to the Gulf of Aqaba. You you've got you've got serious serious problems that just there too. Now this is the part of greatest interest. I haven't skipped anything. The next paragraph. At least one of the six rivers, the Jordan, has been developed to the point that no further usable water resources can be extracted from the system. Redistribution of the water is possible using various diversion strategies, but selective exploitation of the highest quality water available in the Jordan system has already increased the salinity of downstream water supplies to concentrations that render it unfit for many uses. Problems of water use in the region are further exacerbated by a surviving tradition reinforced by current ideologies of agriculture in conditions under which modern agriculture may be pursued only through application of massive energy and water subsidies. Right, so you guys will remember how the Jews fulfilled those prophecies of making the valleys bloom, and then how they claimed to have the forests uh, that are growing in Negev. All smoke and mirrors. You're looking at the work of the great Wizard of Oz. And now he continues. This is not unique to the Middle East. The United States food industry now expends 9 calories of fossil fuel for every calorie of food value delivered to an American household. But in the Middle Eastern and in particular Israeli agriculture, the energy subsidy to the agricultural sector is absurdly high. And he won't even give the number. It must be that absurd or this was that absurd this is 1982 in large part because of the great expense of bringing sufficient irrigation water to the most productive soils so it's not it's not just about you know the water being wherever it's near not all of the soils of the land that any water or wadi flows through is the most productive okay so they have to they they've had to implement all of these irrigation systems they've had to dig channels along the jordan uh, on either side uh to to keep these places producing like they do so all of this propaganda that you'll see if you go to Wikipedia and say you want to see a Wikipedia page on Gilead or let's just say the Jordan Valley and all that they're not telling you about all of the extensive unnatural and I'm gonna say it like that just because it's modern techniques is what it took to even get it as far as it was in 82 it's it's all bogus they're not telling you about everything that had to go into that and it has been massively expensive you don't even know um, the kind of importation done into is not real on a on a monthly basis these days the kind of consumption there um, it's insane and I know a lot of it they're they're keeping under wraps now he continues fully one fifth fully one fifth of the energy resources currently consumed in Israel is used for pumping water pumping water and 80 percent of that water is for agriculture Israel's per capita annual water use in excess of 500 cubic meters which if I remember right 
that would be 500,000 liters or wait no it'd be 5 million liters is on a par with that of the major industrialized countries the major industrialized countries where water resources are exponentially greater if this pattern of use continues Israel will have depleted its domestic water supplies by the mid 1990s which adds critical complicated factors to the issue of its occupation of the West Bank the Golan Heights and southern Lebanon now he goes further into these problems these issues and and so far it has been a real great resource quite an eye-opener too now with what he's saying about their depletion of water resources and the other thing that they don't tell us is how briny the 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 seepage water is that goes into Lake Tiberias you know that they say is the Sea of Galilee or Yom Kinrut very briny water the water over there is is not all that usable and the thing is the Jews over there they only allow the Palestinians to have running water three days a week but the Jews they use water excessively he just said their water use and consumption is like a major country a major large productive country like America all right Palestine's about the size of Vermont and if they have like they say six million <laughs> six million Jews their consumption rates are outrageous oh wait a minute were outrageous in 1982 I can't even imagine what sort of financial and natural raping of the whole world they're doing to keep this farce going he said they'll have depleted their water supplies what they can keep pulling at a population of four million by the 1990s so you guys all remember how in the 90s what was a thing that you never thought you would ever in your life witness as a phenomenon cuz I can remember that was it was one of the weirdest things I've ever seen happen and it started in the 1990s bottled water selling us water which was at the time when like Evian was first coming out which of course is naive backwards I thought that was the stupidest thing I'd ever heard we get water out of the tap or when I grew up we got it out of the well now the thought is well what would us having to buy bottled water and the thing is I'm sure all of the people who owned the biggest production areas where they were pulling water out of the ground and there's a lot of seedy stuff to this whole industry of of bottling water not only what's been done to acquire springs and sources of bottling water um, but the crap that they put in to bottled water and sell it off as something good so you can imagine who's running it right and what my assumption is that because there would be such a need for water there they would have to be importing somehow or another I mean they can only steal so many people's water for so long and the population is double today what it was when this paper is being written that you know in in typical style in their typical style they probably thought well look um, we're going to have to uh, take over uh, a certain amount acquire a certain amount of uh, 
of areas of sources where we can extract fresh water and we're going to have to ship it um, and we don't want to pay for it because we're the privileged class we're the chosenites so what we'll do is we'll take a certain amount of that uh, that whatever we need to and we'll bottle it and we'll ship it all around to the goy countries and we'll sell it all to them and that'll pay for what we need that's kind of my assumption. Who knows? I haven't had time to research that, and that's not, of course, the point to this. But uh, any one of you could, and that would be really interesting. You know, let me know if you find anything in that. What I'm going to do is juxtapose that just that that one page I read from uh, that report done in 1982. I'm going to juxtapose that to Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 1. And um, I'll make it easy on everybody and just read it from the World English Bible. It's uh, So, when Yahweh, your Aliyim, or God, brings you into the land where you go to possess it and casts out many nations before you, the Hittite the Gergeshite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, seven nations greater and mightier than you. Now, in Obery, what he's saying there at the end is Shiboa, Guyim, Rabim, O Otsumim, Mamak, which is precisely what you just heard. Seven nations, rabim, broader, um, multitudinous, uh, and otsumim, much more powerful, memek, from you, than you. So it's really easy to prove that um, when you figure out demographics, Israel at this time, they're staying right across Yarden from Yerhu. They're actually staying in a place that's literally called Yarden Yerhu. Okay. Um, and they're getting ready to go cross Yarden. And when they do a count there, we see that they have about the same exact population as when they left Mitzram. And that means that they would have all things considered, men, women, and children. And of course, we're not counting the beasts. We're not counting servants that they had or acquired. They're not in the count. Okay? We're talking about men, women, children that were the blood descendants of Jacob Israel. They would have had conservative estimates. Two to three million. Okay? Seven nations greater and mightier than you. Let's just say the seven nations were about the same in people. Okay? Instead of greater and mightier, which it obviously says. So, what should we do? Should we, should we get even more conservative? Should we say, let's just say each one had two million. We'll, we'll give that model every possible chance. We'll tie one arm behind our back. And we'll give each one of those nations two million. Well, two times seven, that's 14. That's already 14 million. Now, for, for anyone out there who thinks that they can do the insane sort of gymnastics involving anything from desertification uh, the land may have been so lush um, anybody who wants to try to push boundaries and borders out as far as humanly possible keep something in mind those seven nations greater and mightier um, that actually doesn't mention all of the other peoples that are named that also lived within the boundaries of the land that the children of Israel occupied. People like 
the Philistines, the Sidonians. Yeah, because Asher occupied part of of Sidon, and also Dan, when they got their extra territory, were right near Sidon. So, of course, it has to be in this same area, because we're talking about a mound of water, and can it sustain? There is the Gerizim, that was a tribe in the land. There was the, the Giblite, that was a tribe in the land. There was the Cherethites, there was the Pelethites, there was the Kenites, there was the Avites. Those were just some extra tribes of peoples, peoples within that land. And that's when I lost count. I actually have a list of peoples named in the Bible. It's a single column list, single spaced and 12 point font that takes up two plus pages. Now that's not multiple columns, that's just one column all the way down. But it's 12 point font at single space. That's a lot of peoples, types of peoples. So there's also to the north and slightly to the east, you have the Aramee called the, uh, well, most Bibles call them the Syrians, right? Yeah, the Aramee, the Hamati. You still have the Rapaim, and actually, I thought about the other tribe of giant peoples that had lived in uh, in Hebron. That was the, oh, now I can't remember their name off the top of my head, but there were those as well, the Rapaim being giants. There was the Geshuri, the Mocha'i, the, um, the Agari, there was the... Omani, or the Ammonites, there was the Moabi, the Moabites, there was the Adami, the Edomites, there was the Timani, the Timonites, the Omlaki, or the Amalekites. How about the Cushi? Because I prove in my book that they had to be in this same area too. We need water for them. The Cushi, that's the people that marched a million man army up into Judah. How about the Orabim? They were the peoples that lived all over the place. Some in the land, some out of the land, some around Edom, some around Moab. The Sabaim, the Dedanim, the Medini. How about the Medini? They lived even east of the Moabites and the Omanites, or the Moabites and Ammonites. They lived even to the east and among them. Then, oh, we've completely forgotten about the uh, Ishmaeli. Yeah, Ishmael. Ishmael and his descendants. All of these peoples lived directly around this land. Now, I, I would hate for people to think that I was, I was gilding things any. And, and, of course, that doesn't consider the fact that even when the tribes of Israel to the north were moved out by the king of Asher, Assyria, he brought in a whole lot of people from other areas, and they were still occupying those lands. It said things didn't really fluctuate that much population-wise. Now again, the thing is, I haven't even begun to talk about the, uh, the Mitzri or Mitzram, where they were, were slaves for 215 years, or all of the conscript nations that Mitzram would often use in their wars and their battles. Um, and just the huge amount of various other peoples named. Um, I haven't talked about the ease of travel that certain people seem to have between lands that are supposed to be far off, uh, really that, that can't be accessed because of um, impossible deserts, and so on and so forth. So, like I said, at a, at a very conservative estimate, at a very conservative estimate, you would have 14 million, and that's basically saying the Bible's not correct. Even at 
even at if you wanted to get completely insane and and say something like well maybe maybe that's just the amount of people by how many fighting men Israel had so when they were getting ready to cross the Yarden they had about the same amount of men who could fight as when they left Mitzrayim right around the 600,000 mark um well maybe that just means more than that well you can't consider these other peoples, their women and children and old folk, in the same category as the fighting men of Israel. But, but even if so, if you want to get really stupid, you'd have to give them a million per at least. Now, so then that's seven million in the land. That's on the other side of Yarden, okay? That's not over in Moab, Omun, which also the Medini are over there. The Egeri, which covered a huge swath of land. The Geshuri, the Mokathi, the Arami. Okay, that's not covering them. You would have to have at least 7 million if you wanted to tie both arms behind your back for the ancient Near Easters. And then you still have the two to three million of Israel. And that's just to start with. Because even though they killed the amount of people that they were told to, in some cases, in most cases they didn't. They didn't kill them. They weren't supposed to kill everybody. They were supposed to, there's certain people that Yahweh told them they're done. Now, in some cases, they obeyed, they listened. In some cases, they didn't, and those people stayed with them. They didn't move them out. They put them to tribute. So the population of the land did not shrink amazingly. It still stayed very big. Very big. When they went over Yarden, I guarantee you, you track the battles they had, the people they killed, the ones that they actually did drive out, and then all the people that were still there. The population, just to start with, was very, very large. And they weren't using all kinds of mod. Let's just say they could. What if, what if we did that? What if we tied both arms behind our back and a leg and said they had all of the modern technology and obviously were, <laughs> were importing, right, massive amounts of fresh water. Maybe they were trading sand for it. Then they're still going to have problems supporting a population which from the start with both arms and a leg tied behind their back they would have from the start and you know the thing about it is when people settle in they breed they breed when Israel was in Mitzrim over 215 years they went from 70 some odd persons that were direct physical descendants of Jacob in 215 years they had a couple few million it's not that hard folks just put together uh, put together an Excel chart that's what I did for that paper and I even have the Excel charts with that paper at the website you can look at them and, and how those population growth figures, they're not out of the ordinary. The, the population growth they had is lower than some Mideast and African countries today over that 215 years they were in Mitzram. So, you know, the book won't concentrate much on demographics. I will probably, as appendices, put in those three articles that I've written that are at the site right now. They'll probably be edited 
when I put them in, maybe make them a little bit shorter or just revise them because I'm not going to have the, the actual Obrey. I'm going to be using all English characters in this book. And so it's essentially going to look and read like English, almost like transliterated English, uh, only I'm not forcing vowels into any of it. But believe me, once you take a look at it, you, you get very used to it very quickly. It's very easy to do. So it's going to be extremely readable. Um, I'm going to be doing that with the articles too. Just try to make them as readable as possible for anybody who doesn't want to touch Obrey or, or, or get into to learning it or trying to get a, a, a handle on the alphabet or how it works. You know, you'll at least have that, and at least that will be extremely close to the original, at least in form. So, uh, until I'm able to uh, talk to you again, uh, I hope you've enjoyed this, and uh, everybody be well.